Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira from the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil, and today we start talking about type systems. This is a broad theme, and we will only scratch its surface. Nevertheless, I hope that this brief introduction will get you interested in the more general theory of types. The material in this class has been taken from chapter 8 of Benjamin Pierce's book Types and Programming Languages. This book is today the key reference to type theory in the field of belief. A type system is a way to classify the expressions that a program manipulates. These expressions produce values, and these values belong into a set. These sets are called types. But types are not something new. They had origin in this line between mathematics and philosophy that became very fashionable in the beginning of the last century. Most of type theory was invented by Bertrand Russell as a way to avoid more formed definitions of sets. In a way, types would prevent definitions from falling into paradoxes, like Russell's set paradox. Usually, paradoxes emerge when we have self-referencing systems, that is, logical systems that allow entities referring to themselves. For instance, as a metaphor, what would happen if Pinocchio said, my nose will grow now? Is this statement true or false? Actually, can its falsehood or its truthhood be determined? At all? And here you have a very brief timeline of key events that led to a general theory of types and to key results in undecidability. You can stop and read some of those items if you want. Although we shall not dive into the essential properties of types that let them prevent paradoxes, in a nutshell, we can imagine that types avoid circularities in self-references. For instance, in SML, a statically typed programming language, we cannot define the function f that applies it to itself, like f is applied to f. The type system prevents this kind of circularity. But how are types useful in the narrower context of programming languages? They are useful in many ways, but all these many ways boil down to the following. Types prevent expressions that do not make sense, like, for instance, sum up a boolean and a string, or something like that. So even though it's synthetically valid to write an expression that adds up booleans and strings, this program does not really make sense. And we can use types to prove properties about programs. As an example, let's consider jigsaws as a metaphor. Let's imagine that we have a hypothetical algorithm to solve a jigsaw. This algorithm at any step moves a piece from outside the board to the board. How can we prove that the algorithm is correct? To show that the algorithm solves the puzzle, we need to show that the algorithm has three properties. First, if the puzzle is in a solvable state, then the algorithm needs to be able to take an action. Second, if the algorithm takes an action and changes the state, the new state must also be solvable. And finally, the number of possible steps is finite. These three properties have names. The first that says that we can always take a step in a solvable state is called progress. The second that says that if we step in a solvable state, then we go to another solvable state is called preservation. And the last one is called termination. Obviously, in general, proving termination is undecidable, but type systems give us a way to reason about progress and preservation. To see how that works, we can imagine that jigsaw states have types. We have two types, solvable and unsolvable. If we can type check the puzzle, then we can find out if we are in a solvable or unsolvable state. And if we can show that the algorithm preserves types, then we have preservation. 
And if you can show that the that any solvable type lets the algorithm to take a step, then you have progress. Well, that was a rather brief introduction to the history of type systems. In the next class, we start talking about how type systems are useful in the context of programming languages.